um, hopefully, well, I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll enjoy it. We're leaving doors and windows open to increase the ventilation. And obviously there's quite plenty of seats, so do feel free to move if you want to space yourself more. Um, it's fantastic that Scott's uh, come up. He's come up from Edinburgh to, to talk uh, to us tonight. This was originally going to be a year or so ago, and this seems to be yeah. in gestation for a long time. <laughs> um, but here we are, and uh, and I've had a bit of a preview of the uh, of the show, and, and it really is going to be an interesting evening and a, and a fun evening with lots of fairly uh, exceptional um, stories to be to be told and related. Um, Scott. As well as being uh, an adventurer, um, also he works for Tizers and, and is an ambassador for Tizers, hence the, the Tizers logos. And I'm just really grateful that uh, Tizers have allowed Scott to come up here and, and be with us tonight. So it's uh, it's it's a uh, great. Ask forgiveness, <laughs> not permission. That's the secret. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll stick with forgiveness later. It's fine. I think uh, I think we'll be good. Okay. So with that, anyway, we'll pass over to Scott and sit back, and enjoy, and hope you have a great night. So Scott, thanks a lot. Cool. Yeah. So um, yeah. Yes. I haven't even said anything yet. Hold fire. Hold fire. Um. So yeah. So the first thing was to sort of catch up and thanks Mike for asking me to come out and speak to you guys tonight. And like a special thanks to those people who made the effort and came in person. I really prefer to speak to people in person as opposed to on the internet. Hello, internet. Um. So yeah. Thanks a lot, guys, for coming out. And um. Yeah. It's honestly sort of a privilege to be here and like speak to the room again. As Mike mentioned, this was sort of originally planned pre-COVID and things have changed a lot since then. Um, so yeah, it's fun to be back in a room and speak to some people. So to avoid wasting too much time covering ground, we've already covered, this was this was my plug um, for Taizo. So as Mike said, yes, I am sort of supported by Taizo. Um, I work for them and they've always been very supportive of me and basically like given me the flexibility to go out and sort of pursue my passion and chase the sort of adventures I'm gonna talk about tonight. Um, and more specifically, this is where I get into the really shameless plug, but I'm just getting it all out of the way in the beginning. What I do for Taizo is I manage their ski workshop. Um, so myself and my one colleague, that's my colleague there, that's Chris. Um, we basically run the ski workshop for Taizo. We do all the ski servicing and tuning. So to get my shameless plug out of the way in the beginning, if you enjoy my talk tonight, one way that you can help me pursue all my wild adventures is bring your skis into Taizo and we'll look after you. We are honestly, we are quite obsessive and passionate about the work we do on skis. Um, so yeah, bring them in and we will do the best job we can for you. But anyway, enough of that. Let's talk about adventure. All right. So that was my theme for tonight. Mike asked me to come and do a talk, but he didn't really give me any specifics on what he wanted me to talk about. So he's given me a, a blank slate, as it were. So tonight we're going to talk about the thing that perhaps I am most passionate about in the broadest sense, which is just adventure. And so, so what is adventure? You can talk about adventure and different people define adventure differently. Um, so I thought I would sort of start by giving us a little bit of a structure in terms of like, what is adventure to me and how do, how do I define adventure? So it's worth saying that some of this conceptually is, is a little bit paraphrased from the uh, world famous high altitude mountaineer, Reinhold Messner. Um, I really like the way that he sort of describes and, and how he sort of categorizes what makes an experience an adventure. Um, so basically, if, if you listen to Messner, and I tend to agree with him on this, in order for an experience to be an adventure, um, you basically need some, some key ingredients need to be present. And the first ingredient is uncertainty. Um, it wouldn't really be an adventure if you were just heading out and the outcome was, was too certain. Um, you need to be exposed. You need exposure and you need challenge. And we're going to talk a little bit more about each of these. Before I go on any further, I just want to say as well that like all the photos you're going to see tonight are either photos by me or photo photos of me by a lot of my my close friends. So um, like that one, that, that that's me flying at Glencoe there. Um, so yeah, just, just so you didn't think that I was just like grabbing stuff off the internet or something like that. But yeah, no, they're all by me or of me and my, my close friends and fellow adventurers. So a little bit on that, that first ingredient of adventure, uncertainty. All right. Um, so like in order for an experience to be an adventure, you, you need to have an element of the unknown. If the outcome was too certain and you basically knew how things were going to work, it would just be like a trip to the shop, wouldn't it? It wouldn't really be an adventure. You need to have that uncertainty. You need to be sort of entering a sort of an unknown room, as, as Messner would say. All right. And then the next critical element is exposure. In order for it to be a real adventure, um, this experience that you're going out and having, you, you need to be exposed. 
Um, and the reason you need you need that exposure element is you need exposure so that you're you're forced to be completely self-reliant so that you have to look after yourselves and that ultimately the, the decisions that you make, they, they, they need to matter. You need to be forced into a situation where you're self-reliant. And Messner would say, this is perhaps a little bit controversial, that you need to be beyond the reach of rescue. Now, maybe as average advice going out in the Cairngorms, telling people to be out of reach of rescue is maybe not the most intelligent thing. But I think the idea here is that really to have a true adventure, like you need to be exposed in that way so that you, you are self-reliant. And if there's someone in a helicopter that can just come and scoop you up at a few minutes notice, you, you don't really get the same feeling or sensation of having a true adventure. And the last one I, I touched on a little bit before is the consequences need to be real. So in order for it to be a real adventure and not a video game, you, you need to be going out and, and, and pursuing a situation where the, the consequences that you face are actually real so that the decisions that you make matter. So we'll come back to a little bit of all this and hopefully it will all make sense at the end. And so the final of these key ingredients in my mind for what makes an experience an adventure is challenge. OK, you, you need to be challenged. And what do we mean by being challenged is that you basically need to be approaching, not necessarily reaching, but you need to be approaching the edge of your comfort zone. And it's worth noting here that this is a sort of like a personal comfort zone and everyone's comfort zone is different. So everyone is gonna have a different comfort zone. For me, I might be comfortable jumping out of a plane or flying off mountains. Whereas for someone else, it might be a huge adventure just to go up a hill in the summertime. And that's great, you can still have that adventure. It's all relative to your own personal comfort zone. And the last thing I'll say about it is, it's worth noting as well that on this little list of the key ingredients, what I consider to be like the key ingredients for a good adventure, is uh, it's worth noting the absence of achieve your stated goal is not really on the list. Personally, I don't believe that that is necessary in order to have a wild adventure in the mountains or elsewhere. You don't actually have to do what you initially set out to do as long as you have these other key ingredients in place. And so ultimately, once you have sort of come up with some idea or some plan which has these key ingredients for a good adventure, um, it's about the decisions that you make. So you're gonna make a plan, Ultimately, you're going to go out and you're going to try this plan and then things are going to happen and you're going to be in a situation where you need to make critical decisions. And sort of in, in my model and the way that I understand what adventure really is for me, it's that basically the adventure itself is the decisions you make. OK, so you have this situation where there is uncertainty, you're, you're exposed and you're challenged. And then you go out into this situation and you're forced to make all these decisions. And really, the adventure itself is the series of decisions that you make. And the most important thing is staying alive and coming home. And basically, like that, that is the goal of any good adventure. The art of adventuring is staying alive and coming home. Because if you survive, then you can always go back and try again. Okay? Um, so, yeah. And then when we sort of think about this, so that's a little bit of sort of my model and how I view, like, what is an adventure? Um, and then you can sort of move on from that into this idea of experience and what is experience. And so for me, I sort of define like one's own experience in the adventure space as being like, essentially, it's like the sum total of all the decisions you have made on all the adventures you've ever had in your life and their consequences. So it's sort of your knowledge of the decisions you made in a given circumstance. And then ultimately, like what happened in the experience you faced as a result of those decisions. All right. So that's that's my general sort of model for like how how I like to think about adventure. So tonight I'm going to start with a little bit of a background about myself and then I'm going to talk you through a couple of my recent adventures. Um, and hopefully as we do that, we can sort of relate back to this to this model and hopefully we'll we'll be able to touch on some of the, the key critical decisions that I made along the way that ultimately have allowed me to go out and have some wild adventures, but also come home and live to fight another day. So, yeah, that was the the title of the talk tonight. Um, yeah. And the last thing I would say as well about experience is that, and for me, it's a, it's something that I find for me, it's sort of the reason why I find sharing adventures and experiences like this um, to be really useful and productive is that the cool thing about experience um, in the context of adventures is that you can actually sort of cheat this. So you can actually learn from other people's decisions and the consequences of other people's decisions. So for me, like that's therein lies a lot of the value in, in going out and sharing what sharing one's experiences. 
so that other people can benefit from the decisions, good or bad, that you may have made and the, and the consequences you suffered so that maybe one day they'll find themselves in a similar situation and they don't have to suffer the same consequences. Cool. So just before we get going, a little bit of background. As some of you very observant people in this room may have noticed, I, I'm not originally from Scotland. Um, I'm originally from the USA, uh, but I moved to the UK in 1999. So I've, I've lived most of my adult life, in fact, all of my adult life in the UK. Um, and I'm originally from outside of Chicago, like no mountains, as you can see. But um, ultimately, like that didn't really hold me back. I always, I always liked being outside as a kid. And I started out climbing trees and uh, in indoor climbing walls. As you can see, indoor climbing walls were not in the 90s with, with what they are today. Um, and, and so basically, I, as a kid, I was always sort of motivated by going out and hopefully having these wild adventures, adventures in the mountains. But I never really had the opportunity ultimately until we, we moved to the UK. And when we moved to the UK, I first lived in England for eight years and then moved up to Scotland in 2007. And this sort of opened the door for me to pursue more rock climbing. Um, so I got, I got into that and I'd always been really, really psyched by the idea of rock climbing, but I finally had the opportunity to do a little bit more in, in Scotland and further afield. And when I came up to Scotland in 2007, um, then I finally had the opportunity to do a bit of ice climbing as well, which is something that had always fascinated me. Like since I was a kid, I just always thought it was a cool concept to be able to climb someplace you know, only sort of seasonally, only at a certain time of the year on the perfect day and the conditions, it was sort of like it give you this path to freedom um, and be able to climb somewhere you, where you otherwise couldn't be, you know, nine, nine months of the year or maybe more than that nowadays. And living in Scotland, that naturally progressed to a bit of mixed climbing as well, as that seems to be the local, the local delicacy. Um, and then from there, um, obviously, that that evolved into more alpine climbing as well. And you may be starting to notice a pattern here. Um, yeah, which is to say that I sort of tend to evolve from, from one thing to the next. But I suppose the, the broad theme here, while I take part in a lot of different activities and sports for me, what really brings them all together is this sort of this, this pursuit of having wild adventures. Um, and in doing a lot of climbing, one of the difficulties about climbing is when you get a lot of snow, it's sort of, it's hard to get there. So the easier way to get there is with skis. So I started skiing when I was a young child, but um, as I started to do more climbing in winter, I found that I really wanted to use skis more for the approaches as well as started to get back into and really enjoy downhill skiing a lot too. So I've been doing a lot of that for the past 13, 14 years or so. And then after a while, what happens when you do a lot of climbing and particularly in this country where there's no shiny bolts to offer you, you know, like safe, relaxing sport climbing, it's all a bit exciting and edgy. And after a while, you tend to, um, you can almost burn out a little bit. And I found myself that after doing a lot of like fairly intense and some, some fairly bold climbing, I found that I was maybe starting to burn out a little bit. And my solution to this has always been to just change up and do something a little different. And so in, in 2012, I took the opportunity to get into something I'd always wanted to do since I was a kid, um, and that's skydiving. So I basically signed up and took the course and started jumping out of planes, which, which I still do regularly to this day. Um, and, and it's a lot of fun. And so through skydiving, um, now it's, it's a little bit of a, it's a side job for me as well, packing parachutes and filming, filming tandem skydives as well. Um, when the ski season is not in full swing, it gives me a little bit of work through the summer months. And through skydiving, like I found that I really, I enjoyed flying my body around the sky and, and, and jumping out of planes with friends is great fun. But something I, I really liked from the world of skydiving was actually like flying the parachutes and, and, and canopy flight. And I think the reason why that was so captivating to me is like probably from my first jump from a plane, I knew right away that like this, this concept, this technology of like a fabric parachute, which is, is basically a tent, right? It's just a bit of nylon. It's all carefully shaped so that it flies with a few strings. But I knew conceptually that this, this could be used to fly down mountains. Um, and around that time, this was maybe five or six years after the sport of, of speed flying was just becoming a thing. And so the sport of speed flying is, is basically the sport of flying these very small parachutes that you launch from the top of mountains, either with a, with a running start with your feet, sort of like you see here, um, or you can also fly speed wings with skis on your feet, which is often called speed riding. Um, so over time, I was getting more and more into these into these different sports and activities, and I, I really found that I really I really loved flying. I always liked being in the mountains and having that adventure, uh, being able to fly, whether it was speed wings or skydiving or 
or later paragliding as well, really, really captured my imagination as it was just a, a wild adventure. So yeah, more recently I've gotten into flying full-size paragliders, but we're actually gonna come back to that a little bit later. So in doing all these different activities, you sort of inevitably end up being a bit of a jack of all trades and master at, of none. Like I would hold my hand up and say, I'm not particularly good at any one of these things, but I've spent a lot of time sort of pursuing many different things to like a solid intermediate level. And when that's the case, and for someone like myself, I find really what motivates me more than anything else is combinations. The combo day for me is like the perfect day out in the mountains that you can have. Um, so this is an example of that from, from 2018. Late in the spring season, there was some great ice on Bukaletif Moor. So I went up uh, Crowberry Gully, climbed it in about two hours without a rope, and then got to the top, speed wing out, and straight back to the car in about two minutes. Um, so yeah, it was like two hours, 20 minutes round trip from car to car. And I mean, these sort of combination days, like for me, that's, that's the most fantastic thing you can do with your time. Like to arrive at the top of a mountain and be like, oh, the wind is good and know that your physical effort for the day is done. Just unfold your small nylon wing, take a few steps and, and fly effortlessly back to the car is, um, to me that is really always grabbed my imagination. And I, I, for me, I think it's one of the coolest things that, that you can do with a good day in Hills. You don't get a lot of them in Scotland. The weather is not always that kind in this particular land, if that was something you were unaware of. Um, but when they do happen they're they're extremely special. And so as a sort of a continuation of that, um, that evolution, which we had talked about there through different disciplines and, and climbing and mountaineering, one thing I had also always wanted to pursue was, um, some expeditions to the to the greater ranges and to sort of take some of these climbing disciplines I spent years working on and take them to the greater ranges. And so that basically leads me into the, the first adventure that I'm going to talk about tonight from a few years ago. Um, and that is to this mountain in Kyrgyzstan called Kantangri. And so this mountain here, the, the, the summit sits at right around 7,000 meters. It's a bit snowy at the top. It depends how you count it. Um, but give or take, give or take 7,000 meters. Um, so yeah, basically in, in 2017, I, I've always wanted to have like a big expedition and a wild adventure. Um, and at that time I was really, I was sort of developing my skills in some of these different flying disciplines. And I just really wanted to take this concept of like climb and fly the combo day. I wanted to take this concept to bigger mountains. So, so that was always a plan. So I convinced a colleague of mine who actually, uh, Ewan, who runs the ski shop down in Rose Street, and to be fair, it didn't take much convincing. I convinced him to go to Kyrgyzstan to try and climb this particular mountain and see if I could fly off the top. And so this trip, um, just as a little side note as well, I have to sort of work my way through some of this material relatively quickly, um, just because we have limited time here tonight. So I apologize if I'm moving a little bit fast for people, um, but yeah, it's hard to talk about a seven week trip and you know, 20 minutes or something like that. So anyway, jump, jumping forward a little bit, I convinced you in to come with me to Kyrgyzstan and we spent about eight months planning this trip. And after several days of traveling, like we finally arrived in Bishkek in the capital with a lot of hardware because you can never have too much hardware. Um, and yeah, so we, we, we set off. We had some wild four wheel drive Jeep trips up into the mountains and saw a few yurts along the way, chatted with some nomads, bought some sheep and arrived at this place, which is a sort of lower base camp on the way to that mountain we've just seen, Kantangri. And this base camp is called Maida Adir. And it's run by this character here with a satellite phone, Alexander Sensanich, who is himself like uh, was a very well-known mountaineer in the, in the Soviet Union days. Um, so we sat there in this base camp for about three days waiting for weather for our helicopter to finally arrive. And then from there, we got a helicopter up to our base camp on the North Inilchek Glacier. And here we, here we are unloading. Um, so for all the real diehard Scottish folk out there that think taking a helicopter is cheating, which I, I tend to be one of them, it has to be said the approach to this base camp is about 80 kilometers just on soul destroying loose moraine. So it's a very, very long way to go to walk it. These guys told us of a couple very diehard uh, guides from Chamonix in France who tried to walk it and they were like, Haha, these foolish Westerners. By the time they arrived at base camp, they were so fried. They had no energy left to climb any mountains and they just took the helicopter back. Um, so to avoid that, we took the helicopter on the way out. And yeah, after about five or six days of traveling, we finally arrived here in our base camp on the glacier. 
And just sitting here, I mean, I'm pretty pleased. I think Ewan is maybe suffering with altitude already. And I really like this photo because it just shows this north face of Cantangri from where we're sat up to the top here. That basically towers over you 3,000 meters. And it's really hard to give your sense of the scale. I mean, that is like twice the height of the north face of the Eiger. Um, you know, this is like more than more than two Ben Nevises from sea level. So this mountain is, is absolutely huge and the, the face is very impressive. So here's our little base camp here. This is our little tent on the side when we arrived. And this base camp would get bigger throughout the season as different climbers would arrive to try and climb this mountain. Um, but ultimately, we decided to go for basically the entire climbing season. We were there for about eight weeks. And this turned out to be a good decision because it sort of it put us in the good books with the guys who were actually running the base camp. Because I think they, they see a lot of people who want to come there and try and climb these mountains at high altitude in, in two or three weeks. And it's just not enough time for the body to acclimatize and it just creates chaos and ultimately results in people getting halfway up and having to be rescued, which really puts a lot of risk and burden on, on the people that work on the mountain. So it didn't really seem fair. So we decided we would take our time, we would acclimatize slowly, and we spent the whole season here in the Tian Shen um, at this base camp run by this group of misfits. And I say misfits in a, in a, in a loving way because they are, but they, they're truly wonderful people. And I think um, because we were the sort of first to arrive and the last to leave, we had a really fantastic relationship with, with them. They were, they were very, very kind to us. Um, and, and they really sort of treated us like family the whole time, whereas other people would come and go for a week or two and they would just be like, ah, oh, foolish, foolish Westerners. Uh, but they, they, they welcomed us into the family. Um, and, and this was their fearless leader called Misha. Um, and this guy was a wild man. But um, again, we only have an hour tonight. If I was to start telling stories about Misha, we, we could be here all night. Um, but we really had a great time with the guys in base camp and it really sort of it really brought a lot of life to the expedition so jumping it forward forward a little bit so here we are this is a little view the base camp is just out of frame here over on the glacier so this sort of cirque here um, is called the the north fork of the Inilchek glacier it's like basically the second largest glacier in the world it's the largest glacier out, outside of the himalaya after the baltoro glacier so it goes on for a way. Um, and the nice thing about it is this photo is actually taken from Cantangri, but you have all these other mountains as well. These different peaks. This one's called Bayantal, Peak Kazakhstan, um, Peak Karlital, Marble Wall. So you had a lot of different options of different mountains which you could climb. And so our whole plan from the very beginning was we were there for the whole season. We'll take our time. We'll start small. We'll climb some smaller mountains. And then we will refocus on the main event, which is this one, Cantangri at, at 7,000 meters. And so from here, you can you can see actually quite clearly like the roots. So you basically start here at the bottom, you go up these snow slopes to this shoulder where you have the first camp. And then you continue up this ridge line another thousand meters, have a second camp. And you got to go up and over this other peak and then drop down to the coal. And then you climb this western ridge, hopefully to the top of, of Cantangri. So having arrived in base camp and started to acclimatize, we sort of set off down the glacier to go and climb some of these other other mountains in the area so that we could acclimatize and allow our bodies to steadily adapt to the altitude. Um, and first we tried to climb this little peak here, Carly Town. And so we headed down there and we set off early in the morning, having made a base camp at about just below 5,000 meters. And as we were maybe 200 meters short of the summit, this is one of my favorite pictures from the whole expedition, just because you can see how grim Ewan's face looks. <laughs> He, I think he was he was suffering a little bit with altitude. So right away, we could see he wasn't feeling that well. Um, and so it was decision time, which is something we'll keep coming back to. This was sort of my theme of the talk, right, is adventure and decisions. Um, so we had to make a critical decision. We were really not that far away. As you can see, the summit is just up here. It's maybe another 200 meters vertical, walk along the ridge a bit, and, and you'd be there. But at this point in time, Ewan was not doing well. And if you continue to climb higher, when you're not feeling well and you're starting to feel the effects of altitude sickness, you can actually compromise your ability to acclimatize later on in the expedition. So you can essentially ruin it for yourself. So the, the goal, the strategy is don't climb too high too quickly. So we climbed as high as we could and realized, no, we need to go down. Um, yeah, so we did. So we bailed and headed back to base camp. But we knew we had we had lots of time. Um, and so, you know, ultimately we would try again. But at this point, after heading back to base camp also, we had a couple of days of rest and we basically decided to switch our strategy. So as nice as it seemed to go and climb some other mountains in the area for the sake of acclimatization and the idea being we could tick off a few other peaks while we were there, we realized it was actually probably more efficient overall to sort of turn our attention back to the main event to Cantangri. 
It was just more practical, easier to access, and easier to get ourselves up to progressively higher altitude, which is what we needed to do to acclimatize. So, yeah, we started we started working our way up Cantangri. Now, and on this trip, as you can see here, like there's there are some fixed ropes in place. Okay, like th 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 this rope that Ewan has here, it's not actually real rope. It's like the plastic stuff you get at Aldi. So there's some fairly suspicious fixed ropes in place. But other than that, we, we were completely unsupported. So all of our equipment, all of our food and gas and everything that we would need on the mountain, like we were ultimately going to have to haul up there ourselves. So we started sort of doing rotations, climbing higher on the mountain, bringing some gear and supplies up, getting more acclimatized, and then we would, we would make our final attempt for the summit. So here's that little shoulder. This is the first camp, about only about 600 meters above, above the glacier here. And then above camp one, you continue sort of hitting up this ridge and you can see this slightly frayed fixed ropes in place there. That was a sort of a running theme of this whole, of this whole climb was poorly equipped fixed ropes. Um, I mean, we ran into some of these guys that were going out fixing ropes in the base camp the day before, just absolutely steaming, drinking a lot of vodka. Like, oh, what are you guys up to tomorrow? Like, oh, I'm going fixing ropes at the camp too. You're like, oh, all right, awesome. Um, and the whole while, as you're climbing higher, you just have this enormous face. You have this enormous towering 3,000 meter face just like towering over you. And the top bit there that you can see is sort of a different color is actually marble. The last thousand meters or something of it is made of marble, which is quite unique. You don't find that in, in too many areas. And so this is just, just getting up almost to camp two. Um, so it's about a thousand meters of ridge between camp one and camp two. And then you arrive at uh, where the tents here on this snowy shoulder at camp two. Camp two is quite comfortable, lots of space. And then above camp two, you need to continue up this snowy ridge and, and climb through this very loose and somewhat dangerous rock band, which takes you up to the top of this sort of sub peak, this shoulder, which is called Chapai up north. And it's about 6,000 meters. Um, so here, here, here I am happy to have made it up to that point and, and feeling pretty good on one of our acclimatization rotations. You and Zip just behind me there. Um, so you're constantly working your way up the mountain to, to get higher, expose your body to the thin air and the high altitude. And then you need to work your way back to base camp to rest in the lower altitude to allow your body to actually acclimatize to the high altitude. And so as we were doing this, as we were working our way progressively higher up the mountain, this sort of secret plan, which I had not really oversold to a lot of people, you know, was, was always that my goal and why we selected this particular peak um, was to try and fly off the top. So part of this strategy involved trying to fly from steadily increasing altitude as the expedition went on. Okay. So the idea was as we would be, you know, carrying gear up the mountain, we'd go to camp one, then maybe camp two, we'd try and fly from there to give me exposure to flying at progressively higher altitude and ultimately to build confidence so that if the conditions were right, I could attempt a flight from the summit. Um, but like the best made plans, it didn't work. Um, it just, it, it really did not pan out. Ultimately it had to do with the wind and the conditions and I never really had the conditions to fly very much at all from some of these intermediary camps. I'd always sussed out like, oh, camp two, that would be a good place to fly. But I always had really strong tailwinds coming down the mountain. And at that altitude, it's, it's very, very difficult to launch such a small glider um, with a wind coming from behind you. You really need a headwind in order to do it. So it didn't really work. And in fact, all I managed was just, just this one little flight from only 300 meters above the glacier. So really like halfway to camp one, which was not what I had hoped for. Um, but to put things into perspective, this is a little footage from, from you and drone. To put things into perspective, this slope, you don't really get a sense of how steep it is, but it's about 45 degrees. And like, watch how fast I have to run to try and get flying. I'm running for my life about 100 meters down a 45 degree slope. At lower altitude in Scotland, I'd have been flying after about three steps there. Um, and this is 4,300 meters. So the density of the air, it, it does make a significant difference. Um, there was also a little climber who I flew right over his head there. I don't think he was expecting that. Um, but anyway, so I managed this one little flight um, and I was able to land there at the bottom of the glacier. But ultimately, Although it wasn't what I had hoped for in terms of having several flights from increasingly higher altitudes, in the end, it was very, very important to me because it proved to me in my own mind that landing on the glacier at 4,000 meters with such a small wing would in fact be possible. To give you a little bit of background without delving into all the details, like this is not something that has been done really by many, if any, people before with such a small glider at such high altitude. And the big difference when you fly such a small wing at really high altitude is just basically speed. 
you just go a lot faster. So I knew that coming into land at 4,000 meters was, you know, potentially a sort of a hairy thing to do. Um, but having that one flight, it basically gave me the confidence that I would be able to land safely. But other than that, that was, that was all I got. And so eventually after a couple of days in base camp, um, we sort of heard through the grapevine that there was a period of good weather coming. We were reasonably well acclimatized. We had our equipment, we had lots of gear and food and supplies in camp too. So we thought, well, this is our chance, right? We need to go for it. So we had a lot of food and equipment, everything stashed in camp too. So we climbed very quickly from base camp in one day, about 1500 meters, which doesn't sound like a lot, but at that altitude, it's quite a lot up, up to camp too. Spent the night there. And then after that really fast moving day with very light bags, which was really satisfying, we had the opposite a very slow moving day with outrageously heavy packs because now we need to carry all of that equipment and food and supplies and gas up and over that little sub peak and get back down to the coal to our, our third camp. So this is uh, this is just a little bit of a clip to show you that, yeah, on this particular day, it wasn't a great day out. Where are we, Moyer? Go through the misery of our set, Camp 3. We're at about 5,800 meters. Fucking cold. That that was all I had to say about it. At, at the point, that was like the limits of my commentary ability. It, it was cold, um, and it took us maybe eleven or twelve hours just to climb six hundred meters with those heavy bags to get up there. So it was soft snow, and it was really, really soul destroying work. But we eventually stumbled our way into Camp Three. Um, this is a photo of the tents in Camp Three. However, it was not a beautiful blue sky day like this. When we made it there, it was like the other clip you saw. Okay, so you can see the tracks here. So we come up over this little peak, down over this like fairly suspect Serac thing, which involved a wild abseil like over a crevasse landing on this ladder. It was it was a bit of an adventure, um, but after about eleven hours, we finally managed to make it to Camp Three, put up our tent, and collapsed. And when we did, as, as we arrived in Camp 3 and sort of collapsed in our tent, I believe it was that evening. As we arrived at that point, we ran into two young Swiss climbers um, who we'd met previously in base camp. Really nice couple of young Swiss guys. Um, and, and, and being Europeans and better prepared than us, they had shelled out some uh, Swiss franc for the best mountain weather forecasting that, that you can get pretty much in the world. It comes from sort of mountain weather service in Innsbruck in Austria. They had paid many, many, many Swiss franc to get these weather forecasts sent to them by satellite phone. We just being cheap ultimately had not done that. So we freeloaded off their, their, their weather forecast. And what they told us and what they showed us in the forecast was that you, you could see that ultimately we had three days coming up, which would be clear. And so it would look quite nice, but it would still be really quite high winds up at, up at the altitude of the summit. And on the third day, those winds were set to drop. So we decided we would trust the world's elite mountain weather forecasting agency. And we basically sat in our small tent um, for, I guess, three, three whole days waiting for that weather opportunity. We're at about 5,800 meters. It's, it's freezing cold. Luckily, we, we had plenty of supplies. Like we did bring a lot of food and fuel because we'd heard a lot of horror stories of people essentially getting trapped in Camp 3. Because if a big storm comes in, it's, it's not so easy to get back up over that peak and then back down. From Camp 2, you're relatively safe. Like you can quickly descend the ropes um, and make your way back to base camp, even if the conditions are, if there's low visibility. But from Camp 3 to get up and over to Camp 2, it can be quite difficult. And some people have not necessarily made that trek successfully. So we came with lots of supplies, hence all the weight in the bag. So that if we had to, we could hold up in Camp 3 for some time. So we, we waited it out. And on the third day, um, on the third day, ultimately, we decided to go for it. So we left the tent at about 3 in the morning. Um, and it was extremely cold. Um, it was about, I reckon it was about minus 30 degrees C. So it was extremely hard to take pictures. So I have sort of limited photographs of this bit because as soon as you would switch a camera on, it would just freeze up instantly and die in those sort of temperatures. But anyway, we started slowly climbing our way up, this time with, with lighter packs um, up towards the summit, up the western ridge of Cantangri. And it was brutally, brutally cold, as I said. And also we were just encountering progressively worse quality of fixed ropes in place because no one really ever often seemingly climbed up this high to replace these ropes every season. So a lot of times they would be neglected and get a lot of wind at that altitude. And so the ropes were just shredded in places. Um, so, you know, although you were climbing with fixed ropes in place, it was, uh, it, it, was, it was still a fairly bold undertaking in some respects. And so we kept climbing and 
I reached this sort of ledge that I'm looking down from at about 6,400 meters. So basically halfway from Camp 3 up, up to the summit, up this western ridge. And as I look down, you can actually see Ewan. It's just this little yellow speck below me. I looked down and I saw him and, and I could tell. I could tell he was moving slow and I knew he was struggling. Um, and basically it became clear to me like he was probably struggling with altitude again. So I waited for him. I waited and waited. And eventually he made it up to me on this ledge. And we spoke for a little bit and he told me, look, his toes were cold. The guy used to be a ski instructor, so I spent a lot of time chasing kids around in the snow with frozen feet and ski boots. He'd had some frostbite issues in the past, which can make things worse for you in the future. Um, so basically, he, he knew he needed to go down. And at that point, I, I basically knew, well, this is it. The, the, the dream is done because I need to descend with him. Um, but we talked about it a little bit more. And ultimately, if you've met Ewan or you know Ewan, you have to understand the sort of guy that Ewan is. And I mean, he was basically there to help me to try and sort of fulfill my dream. Um, and so we, we talked it over a little bit. And basically, he told me, like, look, he would be fine to get himself back down to Camp 3. There would be other people there. And he just told me, look, this is the day. This is opportunity. You need to you need to get up there and send it. Um, and I was this was a, a heavy decision. So now we're coming back to my theme. This theme is going to keep coming up is critical decisions. So here I am at 6,400 meters. It's about nine minus 30 degrees. There's no direct sunlight. And I have to make a very critical decision, which is do do I part ways with with my close friend um, and, and, and my partner on this mission who's traveled all the way here with me? And do I go for it? And ultimately, like he, he encouraged me to uh, to get up there and do it. So I made the decision to keep climbing. And a lot of this decision was sort of prefaced on the fact that I thought, look, we had two-way radios. We'll be in communication. If I need to come down and help him or something, then I, I, I can do that. So he started to descend. I started continuing up towards the summit. And I switched on my radio. And of course, it's minus 30 degrees. The radios died immediately. So I continued climbing, but with a fairly heavy heart, having sort of made this decision, sort of wondering. I have to admit that I, would, I was questioning myself on this decision. So I, I, I kept slowly climbing. But it occurred to me as I was climbing higher and higher, I realized that as he would sort of come out of the rocks at the bottom of the western ridge there, as he would appear out here at the bottom, I would see him. And I would see his bright orange down jacket, and I would see him heading back towards the tents. And that gave me some confidence. I was like, well, I'll at least be able to see him. And I realized that he's a smart guy. What's the first thing he will probably do is go straight over to the tent of another climber and grab their VHF radio because we had another radio, a VHF radio to communicate with base camp. And I had the VHF radio. So I thought, he's a clever guy. He'll go get another radio and we'll be able to communicate. So I kept climbing higher, looking over my shoulder, climbing higher, looking over my shoulder. And eventually I climb a few hundred meters higher. I look over my shoulder and I see this little orange speck and I see him just walk straight over to the tent of another climber, immediately get on the VHF radio. I switch my radio on and he's there. He's all good. He sort of reassures me. I'm good. I've made it back to base camp. I'm here with other people. Like now it's go time. Now's your chance. And so that was my chance. So I just, I, my pace accelerated rapidly despite being a progressively higher altitude. I thought this is my one chance and I'm going for it. And I did. So I made it and made it to the top. And just as I was maybe 200 meters below the summit, I encountered a pair of two other climbers. I didn't see anyone else at this point. These were the only other two people on the mountain team of two French climbers who did not speak a lot of English and they were descending. And they, they told me, they basically said like, well, I was like, well, did you guys summit? Did you make the summit? And in broken English, they said, no, 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 it's, it's too windy. And I basically said, well, you guys have obviously never been to Scotland. This is not, this is not that bad. So I kept going, the French descended um, and, and I made it to the summit. And so I was psyched. I was really happy to be there and have, have climbed this mountain that, that we set out to climb. But ultimately the sort of the decision-making process and what goes through one's mind it's very different when you're considering whether to fly off a mountain. So getting to the top is one thing, but now I have to make yet another absolutely critical decision, which is, am I going to go back down? Am I going to use the fixed ropes and rappel, or am I going to go for it? Am I going to fly off this mountain? And I spent about an hour on the summit. So this was decision time, but you don't make these decisions lightly. I was now at 7,000 meters, completely alone. Um, and I spent about an hour on the summit, just walking around, looking at possible places to take off, just feeling the wind and carefully, carefully making this decision. But after nearly an hour, I decided, no, nah, this is this is my day. This is the right decision and it's on. So I, I think I think I'm going to try and fly. But there is a there's a caveat to this, which is in order to fly, in order to land at 4000 meters with all the high speed that I mentioned earlier, you do not want to have crampons on your feet. So I could be the only person in the world who's ever arrived at the summit of a mountain of 7,000 meters and thought, right, crampons off. Um, so I, I took my crampons off. And immediately, as soon as I took my crampons off, the snow was a bit firm, a bit compacted, and I, and I felt very insecure. 
And I immediately felt gripped. I thought, well, no, maybe the, the, the risk limit, I've maybe crossed the line here. I've, I've gone too far. Maybe this isn't the right decision. And I really felt, oh, no, I've, I've gone too far here. Um, but then, again, you have to take your time to make these decisions. And this picture, to most people, are like, oh, that's a nice picture from the summit. This picture is extremely special to me personally. And the reason is not because of the beautiful view from 7,000 meters. The reason this picture is of great personal significance to me is this triangular rock right here. Because this rock was my salvation. I looked over to my right and I saw this rock. And I realized that without crampons on my feet, I felt very insecure. If I tried to inflate my glider, a puff of wind could just grab me and scoop me off the mountain. And I would basically tumble to my painful death 3,000 meters down the north face of this mountain. Not really something I had planned for. But I realized if I sat on this rock and I sort of straddled the rock, I could grab onto it with my legs. And that would make me feel secure enough to inflate my wing and, and go for it. So ultimately, I sat on the rock. I felt better. Tried to switch my cameras on. Minus 30 degrees. The cameras died instantly. And I thought, OK, no time for YouTube now. Like we just now you now you need to do this or, or don't. Um, and I was able to just raise the wing up with a little bit of steady headwind. And I was able to take off and fly. And fortunately, about five seconds after I took off, my one camera, which I thought was frozen, um, switched on and was able to record the entire flight going down. So I have a little clip for you here. This is shortly after takeoff. So this is about 23,000 feet above sea level on a 12 meter glider, um, which is for those of you that don't paraglide, because why would you? Uh, a very small and fast wing. Um, I did not have any instruments with me at the time, so I couldn't give you an exact idea of how fast I was going, but from some rough estimates based on looking at the timing of the video and the terrain, I reckon I was going somewhere in about 90 to 100 miles an hour of forward speed here. I was, I, I was cooking with gas. Like I, I burned through a thousand meters vertical in, in under a minute. So it was, uh, I, I was moving. Um, so here's just, here's a little video footage from that. Um, the whole flight from the summit to the glacier took me about five and a half minutes to descend 3000 meters. But here you can see me straddling the rock. The rock was my salvation. Um, and then ultimately, I was able to fly down and there's a few little barrel rolls, some acrobatics here. People that were lower down on the mountain and in base camp saw that and they were very panicked. They were like, we thought you were spinning out of control and you're going to die. I was like, no, oh, guys, I was just having fun. I had a lot of altitude to burn. You know, I might, might as well use it. Right. I climbed all the way up there. Like, I'm going to have a good time. And then ultimately that came in and landed on this, this patch of, of soft snow. Um, yeah. So just just a little a little bit more on that. So I put the orange arrow there because actually this white pixel is not a damaged pixel on this projector. That's actually me. Um, and this was just like a little bit of footage of the flight taken from Ewan's drone. So he's back down in camp three and he had a small drone with him. And this was the earlier days of these of these camera drones. So we didn't even really know if the drone would be able to fly at that sort of altitude. Um, but it did. And, and, and you can perhaps you can just make out the, the speed at which I'm flying here. So this this snow ledge about here, that's about 6,000 meters. Um, so, you know, from where I am now to here, that's like another 500 meters. So you can, you can time that if you're interested. I, I make a pretty, pretty good time uh, descending. But anyway, I'll spare you the, the full five minutes of that. But anyway, I landed on that snow patch at the bottom, had about an hour walk across the glacier back to base camp instead of two days descending down dodgy fixed ropes. Uh, and there was cold beer waiting for me with the boss. So... In the end, like this whole expedition, it was ultimately like for me, it was a great success. Um, it worked out exactly as I had quietly planned. Um, and yeah, it was I was really excited. And this was really like a, a life changing expedition for me. So, yeah, it was it was excellent. And ultimately, those key decisions that I had to make, which were to keep climbing and then the decision to fly, um, they, they turned out to be the right ones. And that's, that's the most important thing is that you go out and make the right decisions. And so, yeah, it was a, it was a totally wild adventure. And then I have to say something at the end is, as well as being this incredible life-changing adventure for me, it was a very long descent for, for you. And, um, and I think like as much as people maybe give me the credit for, you know, launching my wing and flying off this enormous, ma enormous mountain, like it really has to be said that like you and is maybe really the true hero of this operation because, there's not many people out there, perhaps as few people as there are that are willing to fly off a mountain of this scale. There's not many people who would be willing to go with someone like me and ultimately descend on their own. And the epic adventure that he had getting down, given his difficulties with altitude, was really something special that probably goes underappreciated. So, yeah, I just have to say that the whole thing would not have been possible without him. And like he was probably like the best supporter that anyone could have. Um, so, yeah, we made it back to base camp and then 
after a couple more weeks and a few wild parties in base camp to celebrate, it was time. It was time to head home, and so we got the uh, we got the helicopter back to civilization. Um, and I put this picture on here. This picture I really enjoy. There's there's very two two critical things that you need to take away from this picture. This picture is taken at about before ten o'clock in the morning. First one you need to note is the bottle of vodka in this this character's hand. Okay, this is one of the local young Kyrgyz guides. Um, and these guys, we were all very excited. They spent seven weeks for us. They had sort of welcomed us into the family. And um, I think when they saw me fly off the mountain, like they were, they were super psyched by it. And they, they really liked us anyway before that. And so we had a lot of wild parties to celebrate. And that more or less continued until the end of the expedition. And the second key thing to note uh, from this particular picture is this gentleman here sat next to me on the helicopter. Um, this is someone who would ultimately become a very close friend of mine, uh, my friend Carlos. And so I met him in base camp and Carlos basically, um, these guys, Carlos and a few other Spanish climbers arrived on the helicopter, I think the day that I flew off the mountain. And as soon as I made it back to base camp, I'd had my celebratory beer with the boss, Misha, made it back to base camp and basically um, he came straight over to me and spoke to me and he was like, did you just fly off that mountain? And I was like, yes, it was amazing. I did it and all this stuff. He was like, damn it. I was gonna bring my base jumping rig and try and jump off the top but I brought my wife instead, and now I really regret that. That was, that was the first words he ever said to me, and, and ever since then, we've become, we've become great friends. Um, and so, yeah, as we, were, as we were working our way back to civilization, drying out all that hardware and everything else, you know, we got to chatting, we had, we had a few beers, and, you know, sort of realized we were quite like-minded people. And one of the things we got talking about, it just came up in conversation, as it does, was I said, look, one of the things I've always wanted to do, but it's just very difficult to arrange, because I live in the UK, where it's windy and there's lots of rules, always wanted to jump out of a hot air balloon. It's never happened for me. He was like, oh. No problem. I have two friends with hot air balloons. Come to Spain. No problem. And I was like, okay, I'll take you up on that. But these sort of offers come and go um, in life, and they don't always come to fruition. But about two months after getting back to reality and back to civilization, I get a text message from Carlos. And he's a man of few words when it's in written English. He speaks very good English, but he doesn't like to write in English. And he just writes, let's balloon. So I got booked an easy jet. I was like, all right, let's, let's go to Spain and let's balloon. It turns out legitimately he does have two friends with hot air balloons. Um, so yeah, I went to, went to Madrid. Jumped out of hot air balloon with Carlos. And that's his crazy friend in the pink suit. Okay, okay let's go, guys. One, two, Never say no to a balloon ride. Anyway, so yeah, the man has two friends with hot air balloons. Good connection. So over time, we, we, we became friends. We had this wild weekend in Spain and just always sort of kept in touch. And after some other plans fell through, I actually reached out to Carlos in 2018 to see if he wanted to come climb with me in the Alps. And he was like, nah, I can't really do it at that short notice, but better idea, come with me to Patagonia. I'm a Patagonia expert. Um, in his own words, I apologize for the language, let's climb the expletive Torre, which takes me to the second adventure I'm gonna talk about tonight, which is Patagonia. And more specifically, trying to climb Cerro Torre in winter with my mad Spanish friend, Carlos. Um, so to give you a little bit of background on this, for those that don't know, um, Cerro Torre, which is, which is this one here. So this is the, this is the Fitzroy group here. That's, that's Fitz and that's Cerro Torre. Um, is this really, really iconic mountain. It's, it's, it's very well known in sort of mountain lore. Um, and it sits in Argentine Patagonia on the border of Argentina and Chile, right at the southern tip of, of South America. Um, and Patagonia is this like world renowned Mecca for alpine climbing. It is sort of the, the Chamonix of South America, known for its you know, famous horrible weather and these amazing, amazing granite towers. Um, and so now I could talk for hours about Patagonia, but I'm sure you guys all have families. We, we would legitimately be here all night, right? There's the history, the controversy, the terrible weather, the climbing. We could be here all night. So I'm going to have to narrow this down a little bit. And we're just going to talk specifically um, about trying to climb Cerro Torre in winter. And now 
Just before we get into that, it's sort of worth pointing out to give you the context. The first time I actually went to Patagonia with Carlos after I said, hey, come with me to the Alps. And he said, no, no, let's go to Patagonia. Of course, I said, sure, because that's that's what you do. Say yes. Um, I actually went to Carlos with uh, went with Carlos to Patagonia in the summer of 2018. Um, and we, have, we went for a month, but uh, it sounds like a lot. A month is a very short time in Patagonia. You can have very long spells of bad weather, which make climbing impossible. So um, we tried to climb Fitzroy. That, that's me in the, in the super canaletta here. And we came pretty close. We came within about 300 meters of the summit. Um, and it was a wild day's climbing, but ultimately we, we, we bailed. Um, we just didn't really have the time. We didn't really have the good weather to do it. Carlos was a bit ill, which is, I mean, it's still a pretty good effort to climb 4,000 feet when you're, you're a bit sick. Um, but basically... We spent the rest of the month just waiting for good weather that never came, had some amazing barbecues and made some made some really good friends. Um, but ultimately, it sort of left us loving the place, but just really, really wanting more. So we became determined to come back to Patagonia in winter. So summer is the normal climbing season. So basically now, starting November, December, the southern hemisphere summer is when most people go to climb in Patagonia because a lot of it is rock climbing. Very few people go there in wintertime. But we were sort of drawn in by this idea of winter. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why. So the sort of two obvious questions that present themselves are why Cerritore and why winter? So firstly, to answer, to touch on the first one a little bit, um, why, why Cerritore, or as locals call it, La Torre, the tower? Um, and, and, and the reason is there are many, many reasons. Um, it's a real sort of classic in the world of alpinism, and it has all this iconic history and controversy surrounding it. Um, but not having enough time to tell all the stories and history and controversy around this particular mountain, I sort of want to focus on the other reason. Um, and the other reason is that it is a completely unique climb. There are many mountains all around the world. The west face of Cerritore is a highly unique climb. There's really nothing else like it on the planet. Um, and what you have to understand is that largely there, there are two ways to climb this mountain, either from the east side, which is closer to town, or, or the very sort of remote and wild west face. And on the west face, uh, which is also called the Rani route, or sometimes the Italian 1974 west face route, is really like the most unique ice climb on planet Earth. So jumping back, remember, enjoy a bit of ice climbing. Um, I, I was easily hooked into this idea of trying the most unique ice climb on planet Earth. And why is it so unique? And the reason is that in some ways I draw a lot of parallels with Patagonia and Scotland, actually. Right. So in the same way that Scotland, we sit up here far north, exposed to all the weather that comes in across the North Atlantic and just hammers up most of the time. And then occasionally we get some really good weather and it's beautiful. It's much the same down there. So they're in the South Pacific. They get every storm coming up from Antarctica and they basically just get pounded by these relentless storms unless there's a brief window of very good weather. And these storms that there's nothing upwind, there's nothing for these storms to hit. So they basically travel from New Zealand, they hit nothing and they bear straight down on the west face of Saratora. And so what happens is this, the granite tower itself just gets covered in these wild ice formations. Okay, so these ice is basically rime ice, it's, it's frost. Like you get in Scotland, like coats your goggles, you know, relentlessly when you're skiing. It's because it's a very cold and humid environment. Um, so you get this, this frost forms, but this sort of rime ice and this frost, these giant formations form here like nowhere else on the planet. I mean, in Scotland, you, you'll end up covered in rime ice, but um, here, you know, the rime ice is like the size of, you get these mushrooms the size of a five-story building. They're absolutely enormous. Um, and yeah, you end up with these huge rime ice mushrooms. And so in addition to this, the wind, the super strong wind in Patagonia will actually cut features and tunnels through these mushrooms. So like you can see here, this is actually a bit of a natural tunnel that's formed by the wind. So the wind will actually like erode the ice. And so this is why you end up with the most unique ice climb on planet Earth, because in the end, you have to climb your way through these wild mushrooms. And sometimes the rime ice varies in consistency. Sometimes the only way to climb it is to actually dig your way through it and literally dig a vertical tunnel through the mountain. Sometimes natural tunnels form, but it's, 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 all very, it's all very unique and captivating to someone who loves ice climbing. And the, the, the last cool fact about the Torre that, I, that I'll give you as well is, is something that not a lot of people talk about, but is to me is really um, is sort of meaningful and very unique is that actually when the wind is on, which it is virtually all the time, you can actually hear it. You can hear the wind forcing its way through these tunnels and the mushrooms, and it sounds like a giant pipe organ. It's like the most ominous and sort of like doom instilling pipe organ. It's very intimidating. You're there freezing in your little tent and you just hear this like, 
with a sort of ominous, um, ominous sound coming from the mountain. Um, it's not overly welcoming. It is quite intimidating, it has to be said, but it's also, it's also pretty cool. You, you don't really get that anywhere else. And so the, the final challenge here as well is that the, um, the hardest pitch of climbing, it's 5,000 feet of climbing from the glacier to the summit. And the hardest 50 meter stretch of, the, of that 5,000 feet of climbing, sorry for mixing, mixing units there, um, is, is the very last pitch. It's basically the very last 50 meters, which takes you through this sort of vertical and sometimes overhanging ice mushroom. So depending on how the ice forms, sometimes you, you go a different way. You, you might get a natural feature or sometimes it's just a huge fight and you basically have to dig your way through this ice mushroom. Like in the guidebook, it says, oh, this pitch can take anywhere from like one to 10 hours, which basically means it's impossible. If the conditions are too difficult, it's not always possible to climb these things. So to come back and answer that question of like, why, why Saratori? I think the answer there is it's just, it's a huge challenge. Um, and if we think about those sort of key ingredients for adventure, right, uncertainty, exposure and challenge, it's just it's a massive challenge trying to climb these wild mushrooms. It's dangerous. It's highly exposed. You're at the top of this 5000 foot granite tower um, and then you have these wild and dangerous pitches of ice mushroom to, cl to climb. So, yeah, perfect challenge. How could you resist? Right. Um, and, and then the last to touch on that other question was why winter? And this this involves a little bit of explaining, too. So. The thing about winter is in winter, you have complete solitude. So this is obviously a pretty remote place. And there's probably a lot of people sitting there thinking like, well, there aren't going to be that many people there anyway. But in summertime, during the sort of busy season, if you can call it that, everyone is there and everyone is reading the same weather forecasts. So if there's two or three days of good weather, everyone knows about it. So everyone goes at the same time. So if there's enough good weather to make an attempt on Saratore, you can be absolutely guaranteed you will not be the only one. There will be 20 other people doing it. And the thing is, it is a very different challenge. If you think about the challenge, being the first one to open the route, to dig the tunnels and to really have to do battle with the mushrooms is really a totally different challenge than being a subsequent party. If 10 people have already climbed it that morning and they've prepared the tunnels perfectly for you, it sort of becomes a pretty normal ice climb. So if you really wanna have complete solitude, you wanna be the only one there, you need to do it in winter. Um, and so that's that's really what draw us, drew us to go back and try it in winter. And winter, since it has to be said, are extremely rare. It's only been done twice in the past on the west face, once on the east side. Um, so yeah, these, these sort of winter ascents of Saratoy are, are very rare and coveted descent. So skipping forward in time after waiting a few weeks of bad weather and just hanging out in the climbing wall, more barbecuing. And this time, because it's winter, we could just go for a bit of ski touring when the weather would, would give in for a few hours. Um, so we finally made another critical decision. And the decision was to, uh, to hike into the mountains and go for it. So without going into all the gory details, just simply getting to the bottom of the west face of Saratori is a huge mission in itself. Uh, it's about 25 miles, about half of which is on sort of not very good paths and loose scree and rocks. And then you need to climb up about 1500 meters and get onto this enormous glacier, the Southern Patagonia ice field. And from there, you need to use skis because it's winter time, there's a lot of soft snow. So you need to be carrying all your food, all your fuel, all your climbing gear, as well as skis in order to make it across this, uh, this ice field on this huge 25 mile approach. And then you have to get back alive as well. So it's, it's quite an undertaking just to get there. Um, so the next thing I'm gonna show you guys is actually a little, uh, it's a, a clip from a film that we put together. So while we were doing this, we were trying to make a little bit of a film as well. And the reason I put this in there is honestly that if you're there and your fingers are freezing and you're trying to shoot a bit of film of this adventure, it's actually sort of hard to shoot film and still photos. So I wanted to show you a little bit of this, uh, of this film just to give you a bit of an idea of the visuals of sort of the adventure to go out here to the, to the west face of Saratoria and try and climb it in winter. So it's about uh, six minutes. If you want to watch the whole thing, you can, you can watch it on YouTube as well. It's called Obsession. I'll, I'll let you figure out the, why, it's, why it's called that. Um, but yeah, so I hope you enjoy this little uh, six minute clip of a film we put together about this. It's partly in Spanish, but there are some titles. Y la filosofía de la montaña es saber discernir ¿no? entre lo que es el éxito y el fracaso. Las cimas fáciles, por lo general, no te enseñan nada. ¿Qué es el éxito y el fracaso? El fracaso para mí es no volver de una expedición, no volver amigos, volver con 
algún tipo de problema que hayas podido tener en la expedición, unas congelaciones, un accidente. Si todo más o menos ha salido bien, has vuelto vivo y has vuelto amigos, aunque no traigas la cima, de alguna forma has triunfado. ¿no? So here we are in the middle of the ice cap, uh, trying to get a point with GPS. Scott is working on these things. 3.9 miles to Filaroso. Three points. Unbelievable. Ah, Circo de los Altares. What's also cold? Mines too. We are really cold. It's been windy a little bit in the morning. And we're waiting. And we're waiting. It's going to be windy the next few days. We'll track. So we're going to have to wait it out for the right moment to attack. <laughs> Well, we fight for the big fight, but I think after two days in the tent waiting for the right window, four days, four days, I can't even count anymore. Seems like we just don't have enough to do the last 300 meters of hard climbing to the summit. Para mí es muy importante volver vivo de las montañas. Yo creo que el juego radica en ser capaz de, de arriesgar cuando hay que arriesgar, pero también ser, ser consciente del riesgo y, y saber dar un, un paso atrás cuando es necesario. Una de las cosas bonitas que tiene la montaña y esas experiencias tan intensas con el riesgo es que te lo puedes contar, transmitirlo, compartirlo con amigos, con la gente que quizás no ha estado en esas montañas y con la que puedes eh, compartir esas experiencias. No hay que arriesgar de más, hay que ser consciente de que un pequeño paso en falso puede acabar con el juego de golpe. Y es importante volver para soñar con nuevos objetivos, con montañas aún más bonitas. Aunque para mí las montañas de la Patagonia probablemente están entre las montañas más bonitas de la Tierra. Lionel Terray dijo sobre el Cerro Torre que era la convulsión geológica más impresionante que hubiera lanzado la Tierra hacia el cielo. Hay una parte muy interesante en, en el alpinismo es que no tiene que ver con nada material. Cuando haces alpinismo estás eh, persiguiendo proyectos, sueños. 
Y creo que esos sueños y esos proyectos es lo que más nos acerca a la felicidad a los alpinistas. Cool. Uh, I, hope, I hope you guys enjoyed that and just got a little bit of a little bit of a visual feel for the trip. You can watch the whole film on YouTube if you fancy. Um, but so just to summarize, um, yeah, in the end we bailed. Um, in the end, we spent a total of eight freezing cold days in what you can see is a very, very small tent. Um, and we just really, we didn't have enough food and water to really survive that long and ultimately have enough energy to do it. So we, we had to make the decision to bail. Like we climbed about 4,000 feet. Um, first, hold on, we'll just go about this. So in terms of the round trip as well, as was eight days in the mountains, completely alone. We, we didn't see anyone else. Um, and we skied a total of about 50 miles, about 80 kilometers carrying everything, climbing gear, skis, all the food, all the fuel, everything. So it was, it was still a completely exhausting undertaking. And as part of that, we, we did climb about 4,000 feet. Um, we, were, we were about a about 1,000 feet, about 300 meters short of the summit. But ultimately, we, we had to make this critical decision. And really, the decision was that we, we knew full well that in winter, like there was no one in town to rescue us. There's no helicopter rescue. Back to that idea of being exposed and beyond the reach of rescue. So if something went wrong on one of those sort of difficult pitches towards the top, we'd be completely on our own and we'd be in a really bad way. So we just didn't really have enough energy after all those days spent in the tent to, uh, to risk it. So yeah, we made the critical decision to bail and it was, it was truly heartbreaking. Like, honestly, I was, I was destroyed for some time after that for having to go down. But at the end of the day, it, it was, it was the right decision um, because we survived and now we can go back and try again. And that's, that's certainly the plan. So yeah, once all these travel restrictions disappear, we will uh, we will we will go back for for a round two, and it was uh, yeah we we had a lot of time to reflect on this decision as we were walking the 25 miles back to town. So it was just a really long and exhausting trip back to town, and and, and I love this photo. So yeah, so in the end, um, as I said in the beginning, although we did not manage to achieve our our stated goal. Um, we had all the ingredients for a fantastic adventure, and we, we really did have a great trip and a great adventure. Probably one of the best adventures that I've ever had. So, yeah, pretty psyched to go back and give it another try. So just moving on, as I'm, I'm aware, we're getting on a little bit in time. Like the last little thing in the last adventure I just wanted to speak about before we, before we tie things up here was something I mentioned earlier, which was, which was paragliding. So after all of these lockdowns and international travel restrictions came in, uh, Argentina made its way rapidly onto the red list where, where it remained for some time. Um, and to avoid going crazy in the meantime, obviously not during the height of lockdowns, but as things started to open up, I decided I would use the time and, and sort of put the energy and the spare time that I had into learning to fly paragliders. Okay, and I guess a lot of people would ask, like, what is what is the difference between a paraglider and the sort of the speed wing, the wing that I had flown off the large mountain in Kyrgyzstan and Cantangri? Um, and ultimately the difference there is, is the size of the wing, but it's also the ability to go up. It's the ability to use thermals and rising air to climb high into the sky and then glide and sort of cover distance. So as opposed to just really fast flights down mountains in, in, as a descent wing um, with a full-size paraglider, it really opens up this whole realm of, of new possibilities. Um, because you can fly high in the sky and, and, and fly far, which is basically sort of the adventure that I've been working on over the last couple of years. So I just wanted to share like a little bit of insight about that um, and just to sort of sum things up, sort of just relate that back to this sort of idea of, of how I define adventure. Um, and so, as I said, basically, you know, I had flown these small wings down mountains in the past, but flying big paragliders, which allows you to climb high, is like it's a different beast altogether. Um, and this was some flying from the Alps this summer. So in order to fly high, like you need to, you need to find thermals, you need to locate this rising air and you need to essentially grab onto them with a wing and spiral around and let them carry you high into the sky, which is just really this wild experience. It's definitely, uh, if you ever get the chance, you should, you should definitely do it. Um, yeah, and if you're able to do this, if you're able to find thermals on the right day and climb high into the sky, then you can fly distance. You can fly from one mountain to the other, and it sort of opens up this whole new realm of possibilities. You may have caught on to this idea that over the years, I've been sort of developing various different skills sort of because they open up new avenues for different adventures and new possibilities. And um, yeah, for me, paragliding has been a great one. And I think the reason I like it so much is that it really has all of those ingredients for adventure that I talked about from the beginning. They're all there by default. They're there every time. And I'll sort of explain what I mean by that. So if we think about the first one, if we think about uncertainty, like 
every time you take off for a flight on a paraglider, you know it will be uncertain. Because honestly, in a simple sense, if you just wanted to walk to the hill and you're an experienced pilot, like you know if the wind is right, you can take off and fly to the bottom of the hill. But once you get into the game of trying to fly higher and further, you never really know where you'll end up. You might fly three kilometers, you might fly 200 kilometers. Um, you, can, you can fly across the country. This year, a new record in Scotland was broken from Aberfoyle to uh, Banff on the north coast. So across across the Cairngorms, over 200 kilometers. So it just shows you that the possibility of these craft is cool. But equally with that, you could also lose the thermal in the middle of the Cairngorms and have a very long back walk back to civilization. So there's plenty of uncertainty. It's always there. Equally, you know it will be exposed. So you're sitting here in your little chair, um, hanging by very fine Dyneema lines, which some of which are about the thickness of dental floss. And you're, you're basically flying a tent through the sky. Like here, I'm in the Alps, I'm at around 3,000 meters, nearly nearly 10,000 feet with, you know, flying a couple kilograms of nylon and some Dyneema lines. So I think you don't really need to explain it more than that, that really you do feel extremely exposed. And also, you know, you really feel the force of nature when you're up there because the only way to get up there is using thermals. And for those that don't understand, the thermals themselves are effectively turbulence. So when you're on an airplane and the pilot says, oh, it's gonna be a bumpy, it's gonna be a bit of turbulence, that turbulence is what you're using to get this high up into the sky. So it's a rough ride. On a strong thermal day, it's a very rough ride. You're being kicked about by these massive forces of nature and you feel extremely exposed. So the next one is that you know it will be challenging. So you've got your uncertainty, you've got your exposure, and you've got your challenge. Because ultimately, the air that you're using to try and climb way high up in the sky so that you can fly across the mountains is invisible. You can't see it. So actually locating and doing this, it's sort of maybe it sounds easy, maybe it doesn't. Um, but I can, I can reassure you, it is difficult. Um, it, it takes a lot of work and it's really a challenging game. So you know that if you try and go for a big flight on a paraglider, it's gonna be uncertain, gonna be really exposed and it's gonna be a big challenge. And in addition to that, in addition to having all of these sort of ingredients for adventure already sort of built in, what I think is cool is that if you think to the beginning when I talked about the adventure itself is the decisions that you make along the way. When you fly a paraglider, you are literally flying through the sky by the power of your own decisions, which to me is just this wild concept. You have to decide, you have to decide, do I turn right? Do I turn left? Do I stay here? Do I fly along the bridge where it's sunny and maybe the air is going up? Do I go over to that cloud? Is that cloud there because of thermal air is rising? Or do I fly over here to the shade? Probably not, you'll sink out and land. So it's a constant decision-making process. And the decisions you make, if you make good ones, you go up and you fly far. You make the wrong decision, you land. So you literally get to fly through the sky with no motor, just the power of your own decisions. So in terms of adventure, for me, it really is, um, it really is the full package. Um, and I've really been enjoying that over the last couple of years. So I'm sort of excited to see where that can take me. And like I said earlier, it's, uh, for me, it's all about the combo days. So I'm hoping to try and put together some, some cool combination days, flying, combining some different distance flights, maybe with some, with some climbing or other activities. Um, so yeah, paragliding is what I've been doing lately. And it really has all the ingredients of an adventure and it's got some, some cool possibilities. So finally, just to, uh, just to finish off, cause I don't want to keep you guys any longer. Um, yeah, so basically like in, in conclusion, like I just said a minute ago to me and sort of how I view this idea of adventure is really that adventure is the decisions that you make. You know, you put yourself in this scenario, you've got the uncertainty, the exposure and the challenge and you go out there, you make a plan, you go out and try it and the decisions that you make are the adventure. And it doesn't matter whether you achieve your stated goal or not, whether you get the sweet fly off of Cantangri or you make the summit of Saratori, at the end of the day, it will always be a really good adventure. And so, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed hearing a little bit about some of my adventures and I hope that inspires you to go out and have your own, but equally make good decisions and, and come home safe. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Appreciate it. We're on it. Yeah. We're not going to set it there. Uh, what an amazing talk and the variety, of, the range of things that you get up to when you're not scrubbing skis. Oh, no, I, I think I can talk with that. Are there any questions that anybody wants to raise? Yeah, does anyone have any questions? And if people on the YouTube watching on YouTube want to post any questions, then please do so.
Uh, but are there any questions, questions in the room? Give me questions about anything. Doesn't have to be yeah, about these yeah, adventures. Mm -hmm. um, for in which in which context? Like when we went for for Territoria and Patagonia. So on the first one, we never actually climbed the mountain with skis. Um, I just took off with my feet. And what you're hitting at there is like really on point because that is the limiting factor. Um, so if I was to climb, I guess to answer your question, another way would be that what I need to fly with a, with a speed wing, with a small wing that I used to fly off Cantangri, the wing and the harness, it weighs about three and a half kilos. So if I were to introduce a light pair of skis in there, as well as ski boots, that would be another few kilos. So you'd be talking seven or eight kilos of hardware. Um, at that altitude, three and a half, four kilos in the pack was like, that was probably around the limit. I mean, we were, we were climbing without oxygen and the amount of weight in your pack is like really, really relevant to how you perform at altitude. Um, so yeah, I think having three kilos, three and a half kilos in the pack was okay. If I'd had a full ski set up on me, that would have made it more difficult. Um, but yeah, no, we'll. We'll come back to that in more detail if we don't have more questions to answer, because I could talk about the intricacies of this for quite some time, but I don't want to take away from other people. Hopefully that answers the question. I have a question. I'm sorry. I can understand the climbing, mm -hmm. but it's the unnatural concept of throwing yourself off the top of the yeah, yeah. that I find quite difficult. And I know other people that do this. And like, for me, I'd like to know why it is for you. It's just something you feel you were able to do in the first place. Because it's just such an unnatural thing to do. Yeah, what I would say is like everything, you sort of build up to it. So probably like the first time you ever go climbing, it's quite unnatural. If you're just hanging on to small edges on some rock face hundreds of feet off the ground, it feels unnatural. But over time, you, you become steadily desensitized to these things. And I think that you, you, you see them. What I would say is that you become desensitized, but equally um, you see it differently. Right. So like I'll give an example in a skydiving context. When you jump out of a plane, right, people people assume that when you jump out of a plane, they look down, they see nothing. They see it's just space but the ground. But there's not nothing there. There's a lot of air there. And once you start falling at, you know, at least at 100, 120 miles an hour or something, then you can feel the pressure of that air and like you can you can use it to fly around. So it's like there's this whole other element. There's this whole other thing there that you can use and exploit and use to travel. So I think that's that's the appeal of it. I think, yeah, to the untrained eye, you sort of see just nothingness and you're like casting off into the nothingness. And that seems maybe scary and intimidating. But once you start to do it more and you get a sense of it, like the more you do it, the less scared you get. And then you get more into the finesse side of it. You sort of realize the, the, the challenge involved in doing it. So, but yeah, I think it's that like, I think it's that sort of pursuit of sort of interacting with nature and the elements. Like, I think that, I think that's why for me, like ice climbing is more appealing than rock climbing because it's not there all the time. It's that transient nature is, is very appealing to me. And I find that with the paragliding as well. You know, the thermals aren't always there. It's like, it's a game of cat and mouse to find them. It's very satisfying when it works, frustrating when it doesn't, but uh, but yeah, does that answer the question? I yeah, I think so. I think so. It's yeah, still, yeah. It's still very scary. <laughs> no. Good. Well, you need to give it a try. You need to yeah, practice. Do a few hundred flights. You won't find it scary. <laughs> In the back. How have you started trying to leave wings that people ask? Yeah, so um, I think to put that into context, um, I, I haven't actually done that much wingsuiting. I think living in Scotland, it's, it's a difficult place to do it a lot. We, we don't have a lot of big enough cliffs to be jumping off of. So the few people that indulge, there are a few, the few people that indulge do so quietly and it's, it's, it's very dangerous to do it here. Uh, my dear Spanish friend, Carlos, was a, a real forerunner in wingsuit base jumping um, in Spain and in Europe for a long time. So the man has done a lot of wingsuiting. So I should have brought him on a video call to answer that question for you about wingsuiting. So I know a lot of people who indulge, I think living in the UK, it's quite difficult because you don't really have access to the sort of things to jump off of, but I'll, I'll do it out of a plane at some point. I'll, I'll get bored and jump a wingsuit out of a plane, but yeah, that, that's probably the answer. So no, I haven't. I know a lot of people who have, and, and, and particularly my, my dear friend Carlos does it a lot. Anyone else? Yeah, just the, I mean, I, when you self taught mostly, and so the speed flying, I mean, how did you get into that and how did you learn and become yeah, so confident enough to do most it? Most of these things are self taught. I would say the exception to that is, um, is actually skydiving because it's very hard to convince someone to take you up into an aircraft if you don't know what you're doing. And there's a lot of rules and regulations. But I think from, from that, you, you learn a lot of skills which you could sort of carry over into other things. So I got into the speed flying. I got into sort of flying parachutes, we'll, we'll call them parachutes, off mountains, having originally skydived and sort of knowing that was possible. I took one lesson when I was out in the Alps to fly these small wings with skis. And from there, I just sort of 
purchased the right type of equipment and steadily worked my way up, just flying off really small hills, like started in the Pentlands, 100 meters, grassy hills, just practicing your takeoffs and landings. And it's just, it's been a very slow progression. That's what you don't see. It's easy to sit here now and be like, oh, look at this, it flies off all these mountains. But I mean, you know, to put it into context, like it's, it's, it's many hundreds of flights that one needs to do off smaller mountains before you before you build up to something like that. So it's a very slow and steady progression, I think is the key to not killing yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Any more? Anything from the internet? What's the next plan adventure? Next plan adventure, oh, it's definitely Tori in winter round two. Um, I just secured the time off from work. Thanks, Chris. Um, and uh, I've secured the time off from work. I've reached out to some contacts out there. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll definitely return to Patagonia this winter for, for a couple months and hope for another weather window. Um, that one is really very special to me. And I have to say, I will keep trying until the day I die, even if it is the day I die. There's just something about that mountain is uh, that the locals, they say it has, the, it has the hook. It has the hook in you and it keeps drawing you back. So oh, I'll certainly do that. But um, equally, I, I've been developing a lot on the, on the paragliding side. So I don't know. I have some different ideas. Like I'm trying to, trying to do some combo days in, in that realm. Like I think it would be a cool idea to like climb a mountain in the morning then take off at midday when the thermals get good, fly your way to another mountain, and then you can climb that one. Like, I'm, I'm trying to go for the, the double. So uh, watch this space in springtime in Scotland. So we'll, we'll, we'll try and hit the double. But, um, yeah, I'm always open to new things. But definitely I'll spend some more time there. And uh, Yeah, maybe maybe to Asia as well, maybe some more expeditions at high altitude. I'd like to go to Pakistan. Uh, my friend Carlos spent a lot of time in, in the Karakoram. Like his party trick for many years, like party trick is maybe not fair, but um, the guy's a highly experienced big wall climber. Um, so he does, he does a lot of big wall climbing and then he will base jump off the, off the wall. And like, he brings the young people with him to abseil down with all the gear. He's like, all right, see you guys at base camp. And then, and then he goes. So yeah, maybe we'll spend some time in the Karakoram and climb some, climb some walls out there. So yeah. Yeah. a few ideas. Yeah. He's done it. Yeah. yeah. He had the first base jump off the nameless yeah. tower and Trango yeah. towers. So yeah. yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Uh, anyone Fantastic. else? I just, uh, when you, you got so close to Patagonia, to some, I presume you were able to look and see the route. I mean, did, did you think it was doable? You know, do you think, yeah, that, that's a, if we have the stamina, the strength, the energy, and so on? I felt it was doable at the time. I mean, we were 300 meters away. It sort of felt like you could reach out and touch it. However, the hard climbing is all at the top. So there was a lot of hard climbing between us. As I say, it was a heartbreaking thing to leave behind for me. But ultimately, we did make the right decision. So when we got back into town, we actually uh, ran into a group of Chilean climbers, very, very strong. Um, and these guys are just basically dirt bags, just full-time climbers. They don't work, they just climb. And, and they, they saw another weather window and they came over from Chile to Argentina to try. Um, and they had six of them. They were a team of six, They're a very strong group. And also two guys from Czech Republic had flown in from Prague. They saw the weather window coming on the forecast and they flew in from Prague. So about 10 days after our attempt, um, these two Czech guys and these six Chileans um, went and tried the West Face again in winter. And they got a few hundred meters higher than we did. Um, and ultimately, they, they got turned around as well. I don't know that the weather was quite as good for them, but they, they encountered some difficulty in the snow mushrooms there. So at the time, I felt, oh, we definitely could have done it after having spoken to the Chilean army. I mean, if they had eight people, um, you know, the, 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 the people power that you have on the team is relevant. If you need to dig a vertical tunnel through these snow mushrooms, um, having just one other guy versus, you know, having like eight Chileans lined up to take turns digging your way through these mushrooms, it makes a big difference. So I feel like if they couldn't do it, maybe it wasn't on for that year, but we just have to go back and try again. Yeah. And it was the right decision. And it was the right decision yeah. because we can go because back and try it. again. So that's, yep, that's the name of the game. Yeah. Okay. Anything more? Okay. Yeah. In front. What's the biggest mountain you've been on? In terms of altitude? Altitude, yeah. Cantangri. Yeah, the, 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 so the, the one in Kyrgyzstan that I flew off of, that's the highest altitude I've ever been to, uh, 7,000 meters. Um, yeah, but then size isn't everything. Um, and I think that, you know, in the, the, the stuff in Patagonia, I think that's the appeal to me is that it, it, it's quite different. Altitude is the only thing that I would say is not challenging about climbing there. Everything else is, is way, way more difficult. The altitude is low. The top of Saratoria is a mere 3,000 meters. But the climbing is hard. It's technically difficult to vertical climbing. And, you know, usually you're climbing like vertical granite. It's very technical climbing. Um, so it, it makes it a different game. And, and for me, I think that's the style I like. I like to turn up at the bottom. I like to turn up the bottom mountain with two guys or maybe an extra six Chileans, maybe. Um, and just 
and go for it. Um, the idea of climbing the high altitude stuff with fixed ropes in place, I mean, for the sake of getting to the top with a glider so that you could fly, I think ultimately that made it possible. Um, I think you could climb Cantangri without the fixed ropes in Alpine style. I think it's just possible, but in that instance, it certainly made it possible, but I don't know. That's the style of climbing I prefer. I've, I've lived in Scotland a long time, so it's sort of made me like a hardcore traditionalist. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Okay. No, I think that's that's it. That's been great, though. It's been a ter terrific evening, so thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Yeah. So thank, thank you so much. Oh, and it's been no a big, worries. big effort for you. We've waited a long time. I know, we've waited a long time. It's been nearly, near, nearly two years. It's been right? absolutely worth it. And uh, it'll be great to have you back, maybe. Patience, yeah, we'll let around. you know. We'll let you know when we do it. We'll yeah, be back. Yeah, we'll be back. Be we'll keep trying it anyway. We might all have more gray hair by that point, but you know what? We'll keep trying. We will keep trying. Well, thanks everyone for coming, turning out tonight yes. as well. It's, it's, it's great. And I'm sure there's been a lot of folks watching on YouTube that would have uh, enjoyed it. Um, and that's it now until for 2021 for us, for our talk. We're back here all being well, touch wood, hopefully, on the 24th of January with Alan Rankin. He's uh, got a really exciting uh, talk lined up of sailing around most of the islands of, off the coast and then getting off and climbing the highest point on all of the islands. So that would be a really good, uh, good talk with Alan on the 24th of January. But until then, have a fantastic Christmas and New Year. And look forward to seeing you back here in January uh, next year. All being well. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. Thank you.